Hello and welcome to today's show where we're going to have a little look at the World Economic Forum and ask the question, are they losing power? Are they losing control of the narrative? Do you agree with them or do you not agree with them? All of the views in this video are my personal opinion. The first video we are going to look at is from the World Economic Forum president. With us in Davos are 3,000 participants from over 125 countries including 350 heads of state and government and ministers. It is crucial that leaders from the public and private sectors are convening at the start of such a consequential year for all of us. Because the 2024 annual meeting takes place against one of the most complex geopolitical and geoeconomic backdrops in decades. We are seeing a very complicated security landscape and quite a fragile economic outlook still. We are also seeing forces of fragmentation exert pressure on the international system, precisely when cooperation is most. You see how he said there's uh, forces exerting pressure on this uh, international system. Most needed. We know the most urgent issues that countries and companies face – security, the economy, climate change, cyber, potential new pandemics – are not confined by borders. They so, future pandemics. Do travel without passports. And the same holds for true opportunities. Frontier technologies can add trillions of dollars to the global economy annually. And our econo economies can be transformed to be more resilient and equitable. But we can only unlock these benefits by working together. Thankfully, even in today's complex context, cooperation is possible and happening. The World Economic Forum's annual meeting, I think, is a proof of that. The week ahead and the year ahead will deliver important outcomes of collaboration between business and governments. Okay, so I wanted to kind of, we're going to move around a little bit today. So a lot of people are saying kind of what the World Economic Forum, again, these are just opinions, um, is what they're doing is fascism, where you have governments basically dictating and working with companies to decide sort of the, the future for humanity, uh, socialism slash fascism. If you listen to Javier, uh, the president of Argentina, who was talking at the World Economic Forum, he stood up and said the problem that we have in the world at the moment is them, is the World Economic Forum. And he said, if you look at Argentina, it used to be a fabulously wealthy country. And he said it doesn't he did a great uh, speech where he said it doesn't matter how much gold a country has, how well the education system is, how well the country is thriving, business, etc. As soon as you have a government that starts to impose their will on the people and starts to work in sort of air brackets with companies kind of forcing them to go in a, a certain direction, i.e. fascism, you can see a fabulously wealthy country kind of spiral out of control. And this is exactly what happened in uh, Argentina. So as President Perón drew economics, so this was the president in charge uh, in the 1940s. Uh, so Perón drew economic inspiration from Mussolini's fascist Italy. And he started to kind of build the economy in his own vision. He started to nationalize production and things and basically control what companies were doing. Uh, a lot of unions were empowered, but they also increased welfare, which was cheered by the people. So lots of free money. Um, you know, what did we see during a recent period of time where lots of free money was handed out and people would cheer and rejoice and go, yeah, this is fantastic. But the way that they did the uh, free money in Argentina was the same way they do free money all the time. And that is with money printing. Money printing caused mass inflation and the country just started to spiral out of control. What are we seeing now? This is the great thing about recorded history is we can actually see the consequences of some of these things that have happened when governments start to not just kind of 
keep the countries running but start to dictate their will. Okay, next video we're now going to go on to is from, let me see if I can find her. No, that's not it. It's a great video and for some reason it's deleted off my Twitter. No, here it is. Okay, we're going to listen to this. For the global business community, the top concern for the next two years is not conflict or climate. It is disinformation and misinformation, followed closely by polarization within our societies. Okay, so this is Ursula von der Leyen talking about the biggest concern is misinformation and disinformation. Me personally, as a humble human being, my big, biggest concerns are, are my family healthy? Can we pay for our mortgage payments? You know, is my car running and things like this? But apparently, and my also biggest concern is things like conflicts around the world, but apparently the biggest concern for 2024 is misinformation and disinformation. Let me go on to this speech. So bear that in mind, that is the kind of priority of what they're looking for at the moment. Uh, let me just see. Du, du, du. Okay, so this person is Kevin Roberts of Heritage Foundation. He takes on the Davos elite. laughable that you would or anyone would describe Davos as protecting liberal democracy. It's He's equally, standing up for it. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's equally laughable to use the word dictatorship at Davos and, and aim that at President Trump. In fact, I think that's absurd. But I'm going to step aside from that constructive criticism and instead answer your question. Yep. And, and I'm going to be substantive here. President Trump, if he's the next president, for that matter, I think whoever the next conservative president is going to take on the power of the elites, which I mentioned earlier. But there... And you've got a lot of them. You've got Vivek Ramswamy, you've got Trump, you've got so many kind of people standing up calling out kind of what we're seeing in the world at the moment. The, the thing that I want to drive home here, the very reason that I'm here at Davos, is to explain to many people in this room and who are watching, with all due respect, nothing personal, but that you're part of the problem. Political elites tell the average people on three or four or five issues that the reality is X, when in fact reality is Y. Okay, so we have their uh, main focus is disinformation and misinformation. And he's pointing out the very disinformation and misinformation is actually coming from them. And he's st stating the exact words that the leader of Argentina said where the problem is them. They are the problem at the moment. Take immigration. Elites tell us that open borders and even illegal immigration are okay. The average person tells us in the United States that both rob them of the American way of life. They're right. President Trump will take that on on behalf of the average American. Elites also tell us that public safety isn't a problem in big American cities. Just travel to New York or Washington or Dallas, Texas. The average person will tell you that the lack of public safety damages not just the American way of life, but their life. President Trump will take that on. Thirdly, I guess the favorite at the World Economic Forum is climate change. Elites tell us that we, we have this existential crisis with so-called climate change, so much so that climate alarmism is probably the greatest cause for mental health crisis in the world. The solutions, the average person know, ba based on climate change, are far worse and more harmful and cost more human lives, especially in Europe during the time that you need heating, than do the problem and the problems themselves. Fourth, two more here, Robin. The fourth, China, the number one adversary, not just to the United States, but to free people on planet Earth. Not only do we at, at Davos not say that, we give the Chinese Communist Party a platform. Count on President Trump ending that nonsense. And fifth, as we sit here, another supranational organization, the World Health Organization, is discussing foisting gender ideology upon the global south. These are practices that are under review, if not being rejected, by countries in Northern Europe. The new president, especially if it's President Trump, will, as you like to say, trust the science. He will understand the basic biological reality of manhood and womanhood. And do you know why? Not because of retribution, not because he's a dictator, but because he has the power of the American people behind him. And it's connected to Senator Portman's excellent point that in addition to needing a vigorous executive, 
We look forward to having the popular will inform both the House and Senate in 2025 to pass laws on all of those issues and many others. Ultimately, Robin, I think President Trump, if in fact he wins a second term, is going to be inspired by the wise words of Javier Millet, who said that he was in power not to guide sheep, but to awaken lions. That's what the average American and the average free person on planet Earth wants out of leaders. Okay, I thought it was kind of a really enlightening thing. Again, we have to kind of be a bit, a little bit careful with how we word things on YouTube. Again, on this channel, I just want to give you food for thought as opposed to, as opposed to tell you what to think. I don't know who the next president of America is going to be, but these are really big issues where we've got these huge kind of organizations like uh, the World Economic Forum talking about how their main priority is misinformation and disinformation. They have gone after Elon Musk. It's always, there's a lot of speeches that happened at Davos talking about Elon Musk and how bad it is and how bad the platform X is, etc. But it seems that, you know, why, why are they specifically going after him as opposed to some of the others? Um, and just like um, Kevin Roberts has just said here, who is uh, part of the Heritage Foundation, the misinformation and disinformation we are seeing, a lot of people are arguing that that is coming from the World Economic Forum and we're being told X is Y, etc. So I thought that was kind of a fascinating uh, look at things. The next thing I wanted to talk about is obviously they're going you know, the new green deal. So this may be of interest to you. Apologies for the sound for some of these videos. It's hard to control kind of how loud uh, I find these videos. Okay, next video. Here comes the expert decision makers don't even know how much CO2 is in the air. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Panelists, let me just go right down the vine real fast. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2? Take your best guess. You don't have to be accurate. All down the line. Repeat that question. What percent of our atmosphere is CO2, carbon dioxide? Well, yes, it's okay. I'll buy 5%. Five. I'll just follow you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just, uh, I'll see there five and um, suggest that we know that transportation causes 49% of CO2. So that's why we're all working on no. energy transition. All right. So what number do you think it is? Yeah, five. Five? How about you? I didn't hear you, Mr. Oh, Dreher. Seven. Seven. Did you have one, uh, Mr. Boyd? So we got a five, seven. Uh, this price is right. Eight. I'm going to get the high end. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I don't mean to I put you on ice. I ask a lot of people that because all we hear is climate change, climate change, CO2, CO2. I heard a couple of you on the panel saying you're looking to change your vehicles to electric, even though we don't have the electric grid. And me as a farmer, I wouldn't be real happy about running out and replacing $300,000, $500,000, million dollar pieces of equipment because someone wants, someone wants it to be electric. The answer is 0.04%. Not 1%, not a half of a percent. It's 0.04%. And it's gone up from 0.03 over the last couple of decades. This is what we're being all contorted into doing is this tiny change in CO2. If we go, if we get below 0.02, plant life starts dying off. So, Okay, I think a lot of people, I included this video because these are congressmen and they're talking about, so USA congressman Doug Malfa climate change truth bombs. So, you know, they're asking other members of power uh, in Congress, you know, what, what are the levels of CO2 and none of them know it. And his point is very simple. If you're going to change the way that all of humanity operates and works, you kind of need to know these figures and where are we going? And he's kind of pointing out the figure that we're at the moment 0.04% and 0.02% is a plant killer. It kills all plant life on the, in, in the world. I've seen this debate had elsewhere and they were debating, so what level do you want to bring it on? And again, when they were asking these people, what are the levels? They didn't actually know. So again, when we come to the disinformation and misinformation, I'm not here to tell you what the truth is or what... Uh, what is not. I'm here just to give you food of thought for what has been said in the halls of power and the type of debates that have been had and how it seems that some of the powerful don't actually know the science behind what they're pushing. Okay, let us look at this one. And, and as you say, no Australian federal, state or territory government 
has provided the scientific basis for a mandate to push, much less pass, legislation cutting the production of carbon dioxide from human activity and therefore for, of course, coal. Correct, absolutely correct. They have never provided that evidence. They've never been able to specify the impact. Never. I mean, it was so these are weird times. I mean, weird, weird times. Are we seeing kind of the downfall of an empire? How is this going to work out? This is the reason why I'm in crypto, just to try and make some cash, try and protect my family and just hope and pray that something happens and this ship is turned around sooner rather than later. Okay, this may interest you. When I started this job, there were actually very little countries in Africa or Latin America that had one ubiquitous mm -hmm. type of ID, and certainly that <clears> it was digital, and certainly that it was biometric. And uh, we really work with all our partners to actually help that being, uh, um, I mean, to grow this. And the interesting part of it is that, you know, yes, it is very necessary for financial services, but not only, sure. you know, it's also good for school enrollment, it's also good for health who actually got a vaccination or not. Uh, it's, it's very good to actually f to get your subsidies, you know, from the... Listen to this.